and welcome to Ebenezer United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we're so glad you're here. As we gather for worship today on this last Sunday of the Easter season, our scripture again shows us today that, that life in community is just hard. And figuring that out is not easy. We're challenged today to recognize that, that we who are seeking to be a community of followers of the way of Jesus Christ really need to think about what it means to be a place that welcomes and includes all. So friends, let's prepare our hearts and our minds as in this time of worship we seek to be transformed. So now we are called to this time of worship. Whoever you are out in the world, in, in this, this community, community we, we are, are all one, one in Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus. Whatever you have accomplished or earned or not, it, it is, is the, the work, work of, of Jesus, Jesus the Christ, Christ that, that matters here. Wherever you have come from, here, here we, we remember, remember that, that we belong first to Christ. Christ. So let us lay aside the things that separate us and join together in worship. Let's pray together. You, O oh God, are the, the holy, holy initiator, initiator of, of faith, faith and, and relationship, relationship, sustaining us in your love, then, then calling us into your covenant life. Give us, we pray, the grace to trust you, to have faith in your abiding presence, so that we can take our place in your family and live into our call to bear your blessing in the world as we show your love in all the ways we can. Amen. As an as an Easter people, we proclaim our faith as we sing, Hope Will Rise. Easter morning, Sunday dawning, love is shining bright. Flowers waking, earth is shaking. Resonate in life. Now the stone is rolled away. He is risen from the grave. We are Easter people now. Turning power upside down. In the valley of a shadow. True forever, there's nowhere love can't reach. So let the walls be broken down. Revolution on. Yeah. 
Good morning. I am Reverend Dr. Coley Bativia, one of the pastors at Grace Congregational Church in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. And first, I want to thank Reverend Lori for inviting me to be part of your worship this morning. What a wonderful and unexpected blessing in this time that through the wonder of technology, I can be here preaching in my own pulpit and still be connecting through worship with you, the members of Ebenezer United Church of Christ. Thank you for the gift of allowing me to be in your presence this morning as we worship God together. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 and 23 through 29. Listen for a word from God. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. The only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit? by doing the works of the law, or by believing what you heard. Are you so foolish? Have you started with the spirit? Are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing. Well then, does God supply you with the spirit and work miracles among you by your doing works of the law or by believing what you have heard? Just as Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. Now. Before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith could be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. No one is perfect. We do things we wish we didn't. We don't do things we know we should. It's a gift to know that in this community, no one is expected to be perfect. But we do confess our shortcomings. So we come together in this time of worship to pray this prayer of confession together. God of all creation, you have gifted the world with beautiful diversity and yet made us one in your body. We confess that we often identify ourselves and others, first by other markers, focusing on our nationality, our political views, our economic status, rather than recognizing our shared identity in Christ, let alone our shared humanity. We admit that when we see your spirit at work in them, we often try to build new boxes to limit your grace to those who are like us or else we rush to claim we don't see difference, erasing your gift 
and forcing, forcing assimilation by another name. Yet, you are always moving beyond our rules and constraints, widening the circle to include, even when our instinct is to exclude. Forgive us, Holy One, and give us eyes to see your image in the faces of our neighbors, and give us the will, we pray, to do the hard work of recognizing and accepting others and, and loving others as they are. Open our hearts and our lives to act on the truth that we are one by your grace. We ask in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Hey friends, it's really good to see you again. I hope that you are enjoying the sunshine and the warmer weather and even the rain because the rain helps the trees and the flowers grow. So as we gather here in this space, I have a question for you. I wonder, have you ever felt like somebody was doing something that made you feel like you didn't belong? or like you weren't really a part of the group that was doing something. I know when I was little, I grew up in a trailer court in Sheboygan Falls, and there were people of all ages, the kids, and they all played together. It's not like the kindergartners play with the kindergartners, and the fifth graders played with the fifth graders, and the high schoolers hung out with the high schoolers. Everybody, it was kind of like great and strange that everybody hung out together. And I remember being one of the youngest kids in that group before my family moved away. And there was a girl that was like two years older than me. Her name was Lori Hatfield. So she was big Lori and I was little Lori. 
And when you get a chance to play with that larger group of kids, you felt really like, like it was so cool. You had gotten old enough to play with all the kids on the block. We'd play kick the can at night in the summer. That was great. You could be outside after dark if you were with the bigger kids. And like they'd play dodgeball and a number of different things. And I remember riding bikes together. And the high school kids and the middle school kids were always really nice. They were cool and they made you feel like you belonged. But the kids that were just a little bit older than me could be so mean sometimes. I remember I got a new bike and it was just kind of, it was a little bit big for me. And so I was just really careful on how I did stuff. So I would, I would go up to my bike and I'd put my foot on the pedal and, and put my leg over and get on my bike and then start riding, right? Well, some of the kids who were close to my age started picking on me. They said, all of us, we put our foot on our pedal and we kick, right? We get going, we get fast, and then we just swing our leg over. You ride your bike like a baby. Well, that wasn't very nice. And it sure didn't make me feel like I belonged. It felt like the people who were the most like me were trying to find reasons to tell me that I wasn't good enough or I didn't belong or I wasn't cool if I didn't do stuff just like they did. You know, our story today from the Bible is kind of hard to understand in some ways, but what's happening is exactly what I talked about happened when I was a kid growing up and playing with all the kids on my block. It's like these people who love Jesus, right, and who are trying to follow in the way Jesus told us that God wants us to live into this kingdom of God, they're trying to figure out what it means to be the church. And a lot of the people that are a part of this, of following in the way of Jesus, were, were Jewish before, just like Jesus was. And some of them are saying, well, you have to follow these rules if you want to be a part of what we're doing. And then other people are like, no, you don't. No, you don't. Jesus never said so. Uh-uh. And they're having a hard time figuring out how everybody in this, this new thing, right? The church was new back then. They're trying to figure out how, how everybody has a place and everybody can belong. And Paul is like, guys, we're doing this because of God's grace. We're all here only because God loves us. And God loves everybody, so knock it off and be nice. So I pray. I pray as we are, are looking forward to summer and playing with kids in the neighborhood or while you're still in school, I pray that we will look for ways, find ways for people to plug in, for people to fit in, find nice things to say that let people know, you know what, you can be here can be a part of what we're doing instead of being a part of the group that's always telling people what they're doing wrong and that they don't belong if they don't do this or that just like we do so friends i hope that you have fun in the week to come i pray that as you try and show god's love in all the ways you can that you experience happiness and joy so friends, know that I miss you and I love you and I pray for you all the time. See you later. Okay. Friends, at this time we welcome the Reverend Dr. Coley Bativia, who is going to be sharing the message today. Pastor Coley is the Associate Pastor at Grace Congregational United Church of Christ in Two Rivers, and we thank God for her generosity in sharing her reflections today. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you know the song, sing along. Father Abraham had many sons, 
Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. I remember learning about Abraham as a child in Sunday school, singing that song over and over and over again, as I'm guessing many of you have too. But now, before I go any further, I want to clarify, I did not actually go to church very often as a kid. I was baptized as a baby, but I don't ever remember going to church until I was about nine years old, the year my dad joined the UCC church that was just a couple blocks down the street from us in the suburbs of Chicago. After that, we went to church sometimes, but never more than once a month. But still, I remember going to Sunday school and learning about those people in the Bible. There was Abraham, that man whose faith in God was so strong that he was deemed special. And God chose him, and God promised him he would be the father of all the faithful, just as it says in the song. There was the prophet Jonah the one who got swallowed by a whale. There was Adam and Eve who lived in the beautiful Garden of Eden and were the first to disobey God. There was, of course, Jesus, though I'm not sure which actual stories I learned about him at the time, looking back on it. There was Joseph, who I remember had a rainbow coat. There was Noah who built the ark and saved the animals from a flood. There was David, a boy who fought Goliath and later became a great king. There was Moses who led the people out of slavery and into freedom. These are the people that I remember learning about in Sunday school as a kid. And I remember thinking at the time that they were all somehow special that they had been chosen by God because they were loyal and faithful to God. But other than that, the stories had no connection to me. It seemed like God just acted to random people sort of sporadically throughout history. It seemed like long ago, if you were faithful to God, God would find favor in you and take care of you. These stories were intimidating in some ways to me as a kid. The people in the stories seemed like models of faithfulness. They trusted God with everything. They followed all the rules, or at least I thought so at the time, and I wasn't sure if I could do that. I'm reminded of all of this today because of the way Paul talks about Abraham in his letter to the Galatians. I know that Paul can be kind of dense to read, so let me read again part of our scripture from this morning. Just as Abraham believed in God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many as of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. When I was a kid, learning about Abraham and Noah and Moses and even Jesus led me to feel like all the stuff God was going to do in the world had already been done. That God was strategic and perhaps even cautious 
about when to enter into the world. I imagined God sitting up in heaven watching things unfold down on earth. Then God would spot someone with extraordinary faith and God would part the clouds and pop in and make some promises. These people in the Bible had to be extraordinary, I thought, for it to be worth God's time to show up and do something. But one day, all of that changed for me. Some years later, when I was in college, I came across a few particular verses that I had never read before. Exodus chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 goes like this. After Joseph, his brothers, and everyone else in that generation died, the people of Israel became so numerous that the whole region of Goshen was full of them. Many years later, a new king came into power. He did not know what Joseph had done for Egypt. So if you know the story from there, the Pharaoh, the king, enslaved the Israelites. And that leads us eventually into the story about Moses bringing the people into freedom. As silly as it may seem, those couple of verses from the beginning of Exodus changed my life. You see, I had known from my early days in Sunday school and confirmation class that Joseph and his family went to Egypt to escape a famine. And I also knew that the Israelites had been slaves in Egypt and Moses had led them out to freedom. But before I was in college, when I read those particular verses in the beginning of Exodus for the first time, I had never realized that it was because of Joseph and his brothers that the Israelites were in Egypt to begin with. I never realized that the one story led right into the other. And suddenly, all of those pieces fit together, and I began to realize that it wasn't just these two stories that were connected. All of the biblical stories were connected. Joseph, after all, is Abraham's great-grandson. They all led into each other. Both the characters and the stories in the Bible were all intimately related. This, of course, is not new information for people who know the Bible well. But for me at the time, for the way that I had been taught in Sunday school, this was literally a revelation. And this changed everything. I realized that the biblical stories were no longer about random particular people. They were stories about how God had been with a whole people, how God had made promises and acted to follow them through. They were about a God, they were stories not about people who had been faithful to God, but rather they were about how God had been faithful to the people. And I also realized that God's action and faithfulness had not come in random spurts of time. God was active throughout the whole of history. And that helped me look again at all these stories and realize that the people in the Bible were not perfect as I had once thought. They were as flawed and sinful as any of us. This is part of what I hear Paul saying in his letter to the Galatians. Through God's faithfulness to this world, through Jesus' faithfulness to us, we are inheritors of the promise of Abraham. Paul puts it this way, In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. None of us earns our salvation through works or deeds. God's grace comes to us as gift. It's also important for us as Christians to recognize that some of our scriptures, in particular passages like this one from Paul, 
have been used, or rather misused, as weapons against our Jewish brothers and sisters to argue that their faith is somehow inferior to ours. The way that Paul talks about the law, referring to the rules and guidelines laid out in the Jewish Torah as imprisonment and no longer necessary for people of faith, those things could certainly lead us to this interpretation. But I don't think that Paul is saying here that the law is a bad thing, just that it is not what earns us salvation. We've talked for several weeks about this debate in the early church about whether new converts to Christianity needed to also convert to Judaism to follow the rules of the Jewish covenant or not. It's a misunderstanding of Judaism to think that they believed in earning salvation through doing works of the law. But rather, Jews, like Christians, believe in a grace that comes to us from God. Following the law is not a way to earn God's favor. It is a response to it. God has chosen us. God has been faithful to us. And so we will respond by doing what God asks of us. For Jews especially during Jesus' time and for centuries before. Obedience to the law was important because it marked their identity and it ensured their survival as a people. Following the law meant that they were part of their community, that they were people of God. The law was how they knew that they belonged. When the ancient Israelites were persecuted, obedience to the law helped them hold on to who they were. When they were conquered by foreign armies, forced into exile in Babylon, leaving behind their homes and their country and everything they knew, the law reminded them that they were God's people, and it kept them intentionally separate from their new ungodly culture they were living in. When they returned to their homeland and rebuilt the temple, still living under the control of foreign rulers, the law continued to give them a purpose and an identity. So Paul is not arguing that following the law is a bad thing. He's saying that for Christians who follow Jesus, belonging is no longer about following the law. We belong through faith. For Paul, this is what being Christian is all about. We don't need that law to be a boundary between us and them as the thing that reminds us who we are. Because it is through faith that we know who we are. It is through faith that we are brought into relationship with God. We don't need the law to remind us of those differences between us and them because all of the us's and all of the them's are brought together in the church. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus, Paul writes. This does not mean that we are all the same or that we can just pretend that the things that make us different, the things that make our lives or experiences uh, in this world different, don't matter. Even in the church, the things that make us who we are, from where we're from and how we grew up, to gender and sexuality, to political affiliation, to the jobs and skills we have, and the kinds of things we like to do. Being part of the church does not wipe those things away as if they have no consequence or importance in our lives. What being part of the church does do is bring those things together. There is no longer Jew on this side and Greek on this side, Paul says, because Jesus breaks down those barriers and now Jews and Greeks can be together in Christian community. There's no longer slave or free because they can be together in Christian community. There's no longer male and female because Jesus breaks down those barriers that would separate us 
And now all people can be together in community. Through God's faithfulness and not ours, we belong to Christ and our children of Abraham, heirs according to the promise. The stories of the Bible are not random people being faithful to God. They are one story of God's love and God's faithfulness as it stretches out to break down the barriers and encircle the whole earth. For me, reading the stories of the Bible, once I realized that, that all the stories were connected, I realized that the story continues even now. God was active in my life, and I was a part of the story, part of God's people too. I love to tell the stories of the Bible because they are not just stories of God's care for people long ago. They are my stories, stories of God's love for me and for all of us. Stories of God's love that would break down all those barriers that divide and separate us from one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as we are invited to generously share our gifts, we give thanks for the blessing and the presence of God, whose abundance is poured into our lives and into the life of the world in ways that, that fuel hope and empower real life. So in faith, we share our gifts, trusting that our generosity truly changes lives. In a spirit of dedication and commitment, we pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So friends, as we take a few moments to focus on our life together, I want to make sure that each of you have paid extra close attention to your Ebenezer update. Uh, whether you get that through email or you get it in the mail mail, at this point you should know that on Thursday, May 20th at 7 p.m., we will be gathering for worship indoors in the sanctuary. We will be recording our Thursday night services for the local cable access channels. So uh, we will be worshiping on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m., and we will be worshiping on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. We are going to go on an every other week schedule, as the weather permits, regarding worship indoors and outdoors. So we'll be worshiping indoors on Sunday, May 23rd, and then we will be outdoors the following week. 
Now, unlike last year, friends, the caveat here is that we will be worshiping every single week. So if it's supposed to be an outdoor worship, one where you bring your own chair, if it's supposed to be an outdoor worship and it rains, we will still worship that Sunday, but we will move into the sanctuary. So thank you to people who are stepping up to volunteer to make so much of this happen. And if you're thinking, I could help out to make worship indoors and outdoors happen, please contact me directly or contact the church office, and we'll let you know because there's so many different ways to plug in to the ministries that we are seeking to share. And speaking of ways to plug in, uh, this next week, Nick Scherzel is beginning his Eagle Scout project, which is an outdoor worship space on the southeast lawn at Ebenezer. And we are, so many of you have been really generous about this, but Nick is still raising funds for this because if any of you have done anything that is building related, you know that building costs have gone up significantly in the l just in the last six weeks. So if you're willing to donate, you haven't done so, and you're willing to donate to that, you can do so through the church website, through the Give Plus app, or you can do that um, by leaving your offering in the drop box or bringing it to worship. Just make sure that you note that is it is for the Eagle Scout project on your check or your envelope. Friends, the Strength in the Church offering is one of the five special offerings of the United Church of Christ. One great hour of sharing, which we participated in throughout the month of March, was one of them. And now we're talking about Strength in the Church. We give generously to build up the ministries of the whole United Church of Christ, and we benefit from that as well. So what is the Strength in the Church offering? Well... We have something to share with you that tells you exactly what it is. Yeah. 
And now, precious children of God, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and shower you with blessing and with peace today and always. Amen.